We pride ourselves on our research ahead of time here at the Wild and Exposed podcast. Well, I did I did research, but I didn't just I just agree commenting on the fact that before this time I had not seen this oh. page. Oh, not like right this second. Right. Uh, yes. Back off, okay. Hamilton. <laughs> Jeez, man. Make yourself a big supper and all of a sudden you get lippy. No, I uh I read I read the the bio that Brandon put in the notes right before I signed on. So oh. <laughs> I'm way ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get too far and before we introduce our guest, we should cover some of the stuff that we always forget to cover right at the top of the podcast. So Brandon, why don't you lead us through that and then I'll, I'll fill in or Drew, you can fill in. Okay, let me see. So have you talked to Mike at Precision lately? Yeah, so we still have our sponsor promotion that we have always had for the, well, not always, but for the last couple of months, which is 50 off of 500. And I talked to him today and I said, is that still good? He's like, yeah, that's still good. But what we did talk about was how can we change it up? What can we do? What can we make that is really kind of intriguing? You know, he's just looking to gain new customers, right? So if we can come up with this, something cool that maybe it's something we use and it would get a really good deal on it or I don't know, we're working on something. So we should come up with some pretty spicy promotions in the future. He's, he's hot on it. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed Podcast. We've got a uh, no longer hung hungry Drew Hamilton, as he uh, just was telling us he overfed the neighborhood and is <laughs> leaving his wife with two weeks worth of porridge or something like that. <laughs> no, it was dinner party, and I made uh, I made more more leftovers than anything else tonight. But they assured <laughs> me that's not because they didn't like it. It was very good. I just overachieved in the in the quantity this evening that's probably what i would say too if i were a guest <laughs> your house. jason loftus coming to us fresh off the job site in utah yes jason sir. It's, it's been busy for you lately yeah yeah it has just a lot of problems going on at work but you know that's how it goes every now and then and it's a good time of year to be happening right because it's not interfering with too much of the photography stuff so that's kind of nice yeah i can't complain too much and then we've got uh, Brandon. Have you found any mountain lions day? Nope. The last thing we had was a nice bull elk, but no mountain lions. Ooh. Killing me. It'll happen in the next decade. I have no right. doubt. Uh, whoa, right. whoa, whoa. Time out. Have you seen the bull more than once? No. Oh, dang it. But we know there's two be. good ones up there. But oh. we get deer on the camera every day. Bucks? Pretty consistently. Yeah, there's Still two bucks. They're, they're okay. Yeah, they're pretty busted up right now, though. But they haven't shed yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> our guest tonight, coming to us from Homer, Alaska, is another one of our Young Gun editions, Sergius Hannon. How are you? Doing great. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming on. So we we saw an image that, that drew me to your page that I think was probably blasted all over Instagram. Um, that we'll talk about here in a little bit, but looking in your portfolio, there's, there's no shortage of great stuff coming to us from, from Alaska. How long have you been at it? Well, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, kind of short answer to that is more or less four or five years. Uh, pretty much ever since I went abroad to uh, New Zealand and Australia in college, that's what got me really hooked. Uh, just seeing all the koalas out in the wild and getting to see some pretty neat stuff, some Kia parrots up in the Alpines in New Zealand. Um, I had like an okay camera setup, but nothing like what I have now, you know, is a D3200 Nikon and a crop sensor setup and slowly just kind of progressed from there. Started driving the Alcan more and more with my family and I just wanted something to document it and ended up moving back to Alaska after college. And I wanted to just kind of rediscover uh, all of this habitat that I grew up with, but never got to fully explore. Um, and wildlife, you know, was, was number one priority for me, uh, as beautiful as it is here. Uh, I just can't stop chasing the owls and the, the moose and everything else. And by everything else, you definitely mean everything else. 
<laughs> you got some aerial shots of the dog sleds uh, that were that were great. I love the the shadow work, the shadow play you did with that shot, kind of an overhead. So you do do you do some flying as well? Uh, just drone work. Yeah, I've got my Part 107 oh, license drone. here. Yeah, so I, I've been doing a lot of freelance photography here and there, videography, uh, a little bit of branding for some companies just to make ends meet. And uh, right now I'm, I'm just doing wildlife full time. Uh, I still do it here and there, you know, a real estate shoot. But uh, but now I'm starting to get in, getting into guiding and and uh, workshops and uh, yeah, and the rest print print sales, the typical wildlife photographer route <laughs> typical wildlife photographer slash do whatever the heck you have to to pay the bills route right exactly <laughs> and i will say my expenses are low for now but uh <laughs> hopefully i can start ramping things up here pretty soon well i just have to say i'm really excited to have you on because i've been like your your accounts on instagram is one that i i always go to if it hasn't popped up i'll actually search and be like okay what's What's he got now? But it's just, it's, it's so diverse and I was excited to have you on the podcast. And then I'll be damned if like last week it didn't pop up that you were already on Ray Hennessy's podcast, like totally scooped us on that. And so I was, I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but um, did you guys talk about birds? <laughs> <laughs> We did discuss birds just a little bit. Uh, he has a tendency to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we'll have to steer, steer clear of the birds. Cause it's already been covered. Oh, he's, he's great. I've been on that podcast. I got to meet Ray. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great episode. <laughs> I got to meet him when he came up to Alaska this summer and we went out oh. and shoot uh horn puffins out in Seward. He's a great guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We've really got another good trip guy. to he's... Nome coming up too. We've had, Ray on the podcast. I've been on his podcast. I don't know. Jason, have you been on his? No, no? I haven't. No. Nope. Sorry, Ray. I didn't mean to call you out like that by not. Yeah. What, Jason. what the heck, Ray? <laughs> what, well, I'm not a, I don't focus on birds much. So that's probably not I'm just teasing Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Ray's, Ray's diversifying. He's getting out. He even visited Wyoming this year. Although no, also, we talked about bears. We talked about <laughs> yeah. bears. We talked about yeah. all kinds of stuff, but I have it downloaded cause I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. So I'm going to listen to it. Uh, on the plane. So looking forward to it, but it is just so you've got such a skill set, and, you know, for somebody that's, that's so diverse. And when you see like the bear shots and just everything, I've just really enjoyed watching. So now you've got this diverse portfolio, but really what, what is your favorite? Like, what, what are you going to, what do you, uh, what do you keep coming back to with your subjects? Ooh, favorite. Uh, I'd say by necessity, uh, owls, you know, I'm, I've always been obsessed with owls and this has been a, an especially good year for them in Homer, uh, had a pretty harsh winter up North and a lot of snowpack. And so that pushes a lot of the great graves and the short-eared owls down to the end of the peninsula where I'm at, uh, Kenai Peninsula that is. And, uh, so, so I do love shooting owls cause they're around, but, uh, recently, I, I would say my, my favorite is the underwater stuff. And uh, if I had a boat, you know, I would be doing that all the time. Uh, but our shore diving opportunities are a little bit limited here in Alaska, at least in Homer. Uh, a lot of the cool stuff is, is across the bay. And, uh, and so I'll just hitch, hitch a ride with some friends whenever the, I get the opportunity and, and go diving around for some uh, go spear fishing for some greenling, uh, rock fish and, uh, and get my camera out whenever I get the chance. But that's, uh, I feel like that's a, uh, something to be pioneered and, uh, I haven't seen a ton of it. You know, there's, there's the micro stuff and then there's obviously the sea lions, seals, octopus, all of that. Uh, but I think I love the knock or the, uh, what is it called? Uh, the nudibranx, the opalescent nudibranx. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's just so much diversity, so many, so many options down there. It's a whole other world that I'm just really excited to explore, but I, I need to, I need to get a light set up and I've got some work to do, but I've got the housing, uh, paid off my Ike light housing after a, a good commercial fishing season in uh, Bristol Bay a couple years back. And, uh, yeah, been slowly, uh, putting it to use. Captain Curtis Jackson with uh, Mako's Water Taxi. He can get you wherever you want to go. 
<laughs> he sure can. Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> he's invited me quite a few times. I haven't gotten a chance to to go out with him yet, but uh, that's all right. I've, I've got us, plenty of connections here. Yeah, he took us, Mike and I, on our, we did an eagle shoot up there a few years back, and he was great. Great guy, very knowledgeable. Seems like he's out in the community quite a bit. We've had a couple people pay for their uh, their camera hardware with uh, with commercial fishing. Erin Rainey, like that's how she got uh, into things as well. As a she she fishes out in Bristol Bay, and uh, just rolled that over into to camera equipment. But I don't know if there's ever an, a limit to how much commercial fishing you can do to pay for all the gear <laughs> it's a good way to make money but there's there's just so much stuff oh for sure yeah and where do you do your kind fishing? of my goal was to oh so I, i've done uh, quite a bit uh well not as much as some of my friends who grew up doing it with their families but i i did uh set net site off in Uganic uh near kodiak one season and then i did two seasons in bristol bay uh out on a gill net but uh, my, my main goal with that was to, you know, kind of pay off some student loans uh, as I go through college. And then maybe if I have some extra, <laughs> throw it towards some <laughs> passion projects like uh, camera gear. And that's gone well, apparently, if you've paid off a camera and a housing. You know, I'm still working with uh, 200 to 500 here. I don't have any of the big old prime lenses, so. Definitely There's nothing next on my wrong list, with the but... 200 to 500. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. No. I, at least yeah, Jason I, I... and I have gotten a ton of good shots with that 200 to 500. Well, I can't even count the amount of times where I've I've been shooting with somebody with a big old prime and, and I've got the 200 to 500 and they end up being jealous of a lot of the shots that I get, uh, get out there uh, just because of the versatility. And I mean, I'm rocking the Z6 II, which does phenomenally in low light. And so I don't, you know, I would love uh, the Nikon 400 F2.8 with the built-in teleconverter, but I think that's a couple of years away. <laughs> so happy with what I have now. Just borrow Ray's. Hey, man. <laughs> exactly, well, yeah. And if you're, if you're not on a list yet, Sergius, it literally will be at least two years before you can even get one according to Nikon, so... <laughs> but I wouldn't be in a hurry. That 200 to 500 is amazing. Like, I know we're kind of beating a dead horse here, but it's, uh, I mean, I know many professional photographers who sold their primes and strictly use the two to 500. So, yeah, that's why I switched to Nikon a long time ago, but I did switch back because the 200 yeah. to 400 is better. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you, you, you're, you're, looking to get like lights and stuff for your, your underwater housing. But when I, when I go back and I look at your, your underwater stuff here, like that, that shot you have of the octopus, like, so you did that with, with no lights or like, what's, what's the story with, with that one? Oh, uh, do you mean the one where it's kind of in his den? Yeah. It's just the eye and there's like the, yeah. the good light, like right there. And you've got all the suction cups and you're just, damn. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So that was, that was all natural lighting. Uh, you know, with a little bit of editing magic, a couple grade, uh, gradiated filters and lin linear gradients. And uh, yeah, just kind of drew it in there. But there was enough to work with. It was, it was within about 20 feet. Um, I actually have a hard time equalizing. Uh, so I can't dive all that deep anyways. Uh, otherwise, I might be, you know, motivated to try to go the the scuba route and, and get the whole underwater vid videography rigs, that type of thing. But yeah, my ears can't handle it. So um, until I get that figured out, I'm perfectly happy just staying shallow where there's enough natural light to work with. And you can still get a lot of the colors down there at that depth. Uh, so that was that was a fun, fun little encounter. <laughs> I've, I've been <laughs> obsessed with octopus for, you know, pretty much all my life um, growing up here. You know, we'd, we'd go tide pooling uh, when I was out with some school groups and uh and that was always just the most exciting thing when we were able to find a, a giant Pacific octopus hanging out under one of the big rocks down there. Uh, and so, yeah, that was just a crazy thing that, that came up as I was uh, going spear fishing for some rockfish with a buddy of mine. Uh, had my camera stashed in the boat. Uh, found this octopus just patrolling along the ocean floor about 25, 30 feet down. And I told my buddy, like, 
uh, hang on to this spot, make sure he doesn't go anywhere, you know, <laughs> without uh, <laughs> restricting him too much, but uh, <laughs> just keep keep tabs on, on where he's going. And, and I'm going to sprint back to the boat and uh, grab my camera. And so I did that about two minutes later, I was back there and my buddy had his pole spear pointed down at the octopus and the octopus had his tentacle uh, kind of reaching up and he actually kind of wrapped around his pole spear. And it was like this kind of alien contact moment. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then he eventually just kind of morphed into this rock type shape, turned yellow to kind of blend in with some of the coral not coral, but, uh, you know, some of the barnacle covered rocks in there. And, uh, and he eventually just made his way into his den and, uh, yeah, just shoved my dome port <laughs> right up against the den and, you know, a lot of, uh, trial and error with underwater photography because, uh, front element is so buoyant. There's so much air in there. I'm always trying to like try to pivot it and obviously i'm fighting the crazy currents that that catch mac bay has uh so it, it's always a game of just you know spray and pray and uh hopefully something comes out and yeah it was sharp enough so it worked <laughs> definitely worked yeah so you went to to school all through uh in homer right yeah yeah i was actually homeschooled for most of it and i did some classes here and there with the with the high school when uh, when I whenever I think of octopus in Catch Mac, I always think of Diana Tillion over across uh, at Halibut Cove when she would do her because uh, uh, she would do octopus ink uh, paintings. So they'd actually go harvest the the ink from the octopus, and so a lot of her I don't know if you call them paintings or what were all octopus ink. I don't know. There's just an octopus culture in Homer, maybe. I don't know. Did oh, you just say sure. octopusing? <laughs> <laughs> is, is that a for real verb in Homer, or is that one you just pulled out of your... Octopus ink. Oh, I distinctly heard octopusing. I didn't know if there was something I needed to know. <laughs> now I'm confused. I don't know if we're talking about James Bond movies or... I was way or... confused. <laughs> No, that was a Y, not an ING, Jason. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir, just go ahead and answer the question. Sorry. Well, I, I, I will say if, I do have a friend who's got a massive octopus tattoo wrapped all around her leg. So it's definitely part of the culture here. <laughs> really? You see him around town, like a lot of murals and things. With it. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, this it fits. Huh. I love the photo. Well, well deserved. If anyone's seen the My Octopus Teacher documentary on Netflix, I highly re recommend yeah. you check that out because it's just phenomenal, uh, beautifully well done, and uh, you get you get a little bit of insight into an octopus's life and and just their intelligence. So, so you've got you've got images from underwater, but then you're also hitting, you know, the sheep. You're hitting uh, caribou, moose. You've got some incredible wide-angle moose stuff as well. But the one that I think is the one that we're all thinking about right now is that stinking lynx image. That That is a lifer for sure. So can you tell us a little bit about that and that encounter? And it's not just a lynx, but I'm going to let you – detail the rest out sure thing yeah man that was uh it was actually a pretty slow day in denali uh last fall um you know didn't really see a whole lot took the bus in in and out kind of rode back and forth a couple times just to get an idea of what was going on that day and you know didn't see any caribou didn't see any bear didn't see any moose uh you know saw some uh some ptarmigan here and there and little things like that. But, uh, but we noticed that the sheep were hanging out pretty low, uh, that day, you know, they were kind of down in the dwarf birch down in the fall colors, which, uh, was kind of the first time I had seen that. Usually they're much, much higher. And, uh, and so by the end of the, the day, we were like, well, our only option is to, uh, <laughs> go up after these sheep. Um, and you know, we were pretty stoked about it cause it's just, beautiful white rams with all this red and yellow coloration just incredible and uh and so 
I got off the bus with my buddy who was visiting from college. Uh, there was an Italian guy who we happened to meet on that bus ride. Uh, and then there were a few others that got off, uh, dressed out in, in full camo. And, uh, and apparently we were all going for the same thing. Uh, there was just not much else happening in the park that day. So, so that's where the action was. So we, uh, about an hour and a half later, we were kind of figuring out how to approach these rams. You know, sometimes rams can be a little bit skittish. Sometimes they don't want you approaching a certain way. And uh, turns out they were perfectly fine with us. <laughs> they did not care whatsoever. Um, and so we just kind of sat down with these rams, uh, waiting for them to, to get a little more active. Most of them were bedded down. Um, and then all of a sudden, they just jump up and they look up at the ridge behind me. And I, I look at what they're checking out and uh, I see this figure that's just kind of almost like a silhouette, just kind of just barely making his way over the ridge. And he's coming down to, to where we're at. And I thought it was a grizzly bear at first. I didn't know what, what could have been up there, you know? And, uh, but it, sure enough, it was a lynx. <laughs> it was like probably the l largest lynx I've seen in my life. Um, not that I've seen that many, but uh, he looked pretty healthy. <laughs> and he made eye contact with me and the whole group. And he just kept on coming. Uh, he was clearly just heading straight for this group of sheep. And the sheep had no idea what to do. They're running back and forth, <laughs> uh, looking at us, looking at the sheep. Uh, sometimes they'd come close to us, seemed like kind of saw us as a uh, protection. Um, but eventually they ended up heading across this little valley and uh, behind this beautiful yellow dwarf birch uh, that was just, you know, beautifully colored. And, uh, and the lynx just made his way all the way up there, stuck his entire body in that bush right in front of this, this band of rams. And, uh, and he was totally checking them out. He was stalking them. You know, I, I can't put it any other way. Um, who knows what's going on in, in the mind of a, a lynx. Uh, but I think cats will be cats and they're going to look for any kind of sign of weakness even if it is perfectly healthy and it was a good year for the snowshoe hares, uh, he checked them out anyways. And, uh, you know, he, he gave it a good sniff, a good glare, and uh, and eventually just made his way on down. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what would have happened if he had gone for one, but they were in pretty good shape. There was a, there was a fatty or two in there, definitely full curl. And, uh, yeah pretty incredible. <laughs> I mean, the whole time I was just like whispering, you know, kind of talking loud, probably louder than I should have to my friends the whole time. Just like, is this really happening? This, this is not possible. <laughs> I was going to say, it looks like one of those moments. <laughs> sure. I don't do a lot of camera trapping and all that, but I do, I do check for links quite often. Um, and I see a few a year. And so for this to happen to me was just, couldn't believe it. <laughs> I can relate with the uh, talking while you're shooting. I'm sure people that shoot around me or near me are like, good gravy, this guy, can he just shut up? <laughs> Let us enjoy this shoot. But it's hard, right? I mean, when you're seeing everything un unfold like that, you got the sheep, you got the colors, you got the bob or the links. I mean, it's just a perfect combination and you know, it's going to be amazing. You know, you just can't help it. But yeah, think out loud. <laughs> and the whole time I'm like, do I record video with my cell phone? Do I record footage with my camera? Do I take a picture? What do I do? And uh, I just kind of got everything. <laughs> and uh, and so it made for some some good behind the scenes footage. <laughs> oh, man. Links are, links are just fantastic. There was one. So I've got the cabin up at Eagle Airy there outside of Homer. And one winter there was there were there was a family of links. And I was running all over the neighborhood with my camera looking for him. Like, and then, of course, like my neighbor rolls up with his cell phone and shows me the picture he took with his cell phone of the Lynx and uh, ran around all over, spent a whole day out looking for him. And then I come home and there, one was sitting in my driveway. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not the only one who's taken notice of this fantastic Lynx image that we've been describing. 
who else has shown interest in 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 that uh, that image? Well, <laughs> it's a currently a finalist uh, for the National Wildlife Photographer of the Year, or sorry, Wildlife Photographer of the Year by the uh, Natural History Museum in London. Um, so we'll see where that where that goes, but uh, yeah, as it should be exciting. So yeah. what's the process for that? I mean, they're they're you know it's a prestigious award. Like for somebody that's got, I mean, here you're going from trying to decide whether you should even take the picture, or shoot the video, or what's the process from going from you know from the field to the editing all the way up? And I think everybody listening to the podcast knows editing and stuff like that. But the process for like how do you get your image considered for an award such as this just comes down to uh you know keeping tabs on all these different contests that are going on and obviously this is uh one of the better known ones but uh yeah just just making sure that you actually apply and uh you know small entry fee but totally worth it i just submitted three actually and uh and, and the one pulled away so but I, i've got a friend who's also got uh a few that are finalists as well and he submitted 25 so i say i don't do it like me submit as many as you can as as many as you can <laughs> afford to and uh and who knows what the what the judges will be thinking at the time uh just my final i had a shot a few years back we uh barrett hedges and i and his his wife twyla we climbed up into Denali and got a shot of this caribou and had Denali in the background, beautiful color, great, you know, just a gorgeous bowl had everything you're looking for. And I'm looking, I get, I got a message. Somebody said, somebody's using your image in the, uh, the national parks photography contest. And it, it's, it's won a prize but it's definitely your image. And it, it was, except it was taken by Barrett who was standing <laughs> right next to me. <laughs> so sometimes it's just a matter of entering, right? A lot of people don't enter those competitions. And then, but when you get a shot like this, you can't not, that thing's got it all. It's not just, you know, that you've got all the sheep there, you've got the links there, but then you've also got the, the angle of the hill. And the angle of the action, everything's just works together besides, you know, that incredible fall foliage up there. Um, it, it's just got it all. That image is a, that's a name maker. And I don't know too many people that, you know, have won those contests that haven't boosted their, uh, boosted their career by quite a bit. So it's a, it's a great image to throw in there when you're a young guy and, just kind of getting things going and trying to pay off all those student loans. I think this will probably do it. I certainly think it would, uh, yeah, help get the ball rolling for sure. But it's interesting that you made that point because there were, you know, five other people there with me. And I think not to like throw anyone under the bus, I think everyone was getting pretty solid images out of that. How can you not? But, uh, I'm not sure how many of them actually submitted to this contest. Mm -hmm. And so I think it does just kind of come down to being aware and, uh, and putting yourself out there. Yeah, for sure. You can't win if you don't play. That's right. Mm -hmm. Just like trivia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and you're Ron, when you started talking about that and you're, Oh, this is probably the image everybody is thinking about. That wasn't the image I was thinking about. Uh, uh oh no i was actually thinking about it the totally different like super moody uh like purple sky bear oh i knew it would have a bear in it right no like i like <laughs> i i think that was the best bear picture i saw from uh from last year like that takes the cake for me so i was while well, they were thinking about lynx and sheep and stuff i was thinking about that bear shot where where was that from Without revealing any specific locations. It was in North America. We can put it at that. <laughs> I'll get a little more specific than that, but I appreciate <laughs> it. No, that was in uh, Kodiak last fall. Just a, a beautiful spot where you can kind of get some of that sunrise backlight uh, lighting up the fog. And 
it was it was a magical morning. I think we saw about eight or nine bears that morning. And uh, they're, they're Kodiak bears, so it's a little bit different than the kind of bears you're working with. Uh, they're a little bit more habituated and, and they're in and out uh, much faster than, uh, or they're in and out before the fishermen come essentially. And, and so you've got this very short window of time before the sun is fully up uh, where you can get them. Uh, but yeah, I highly recommend uh, people go and just kind of scatter around some of the local beaches in Kodiak because you don't always have to go to Katmai or Lake Clark to, to find some cool bears. You know, the first bear I ever saw on Kodiak, I might have told this story uh, on here already, but the first bear I ever saw on Kodiak turned out to be uh, a cow. Uh it was not a bear at all, but we, we had, we identified it, uh, incorrectly at a, at a great distance, mind you. And I was driving, uh, but we were down there on a deer hunting trip and, uh, we were out, we were just getting the lay of the land. We we're driving down towards like, where are we going? I don't even know where we're going. And my buddy's riding shotgun. Goes, There's a bear. And cause we we're excited. It's Kodiak. It's bears on Kodiak, Kodiak bears. And, uh, and then, uh, so like I find it kind of pull over and then we start looking at it and it was over. It turns out it's, it's like got a fence around it and, uh, it's next to a house. Oh uh, yeah. It turned out it was Brown. Uh, it was on Kodiak. Uh, but not everything that's Brown on Kodiak is a bear. Uh, we did see, we did see another bear, but, uh, but it was on the Coast Guard golf course. Also not very photogenic. <laughs> That's actually a great spot to watch. I see so many uh, deer, black-tailed deer, and bears on the golf course. Coast Guard. Yeah. Oh, golf course. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. Last summer, there was actually a young bear that was chasing uh, a herd of cattle around. Uh, they were all hanging out by the river, and he just started popping his head up, and all the cattle started freaking out, running around, and and he would just kind of jog after him <laughs> nothing <laughs> happened but i mean there were some bulls that would kind of stand up to him but uh yeah it was hilarious to watch <laughs> that's awesome as a as a new sponsor for the show that um <laughs> cow being mistaken by a bear was from drew hamilton world-class bear guide <laughs> i'm a professional <laughs> <laughs> but it was my buddy george that saw hey. it we all say if oh, you're not I just I enabled his misidentification trees, elk or some <laughs> bear. stump bears or some cow bears you're not looking hard enough right so right. <laughs> oh Kodiak is a wild place best bar fights in the world are also in Kodiak Tony's spectator bar spectator sport <laughs> just just saying yeah <laughs> Sergius you got so you've got all this Alaska content and then you just were you uh in Alberta, just on the way back home, or how did you end up photographing elk in Alberta? Uh, so me and my girlfriend have been long distance for a long time, five years now. And uh, she eventually got a job in Kodiak. And so we drove the Alcan, saw some northern lights up in Saskatchewan, and uh, swung through Banff. So we uh, we got a nice, nice little uh, getaway there and saw some elk and caribou right around, around that area. The caribou is just north of Banff, but I didn't realize that's kind of one of the few places, uh, I would guess, in North America where, where you've got some overlap between their ranges, which is I found pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's not there's not many caribou, really. There's a small population, and then in uh, Jasper, there's a small population of, I believe, woodland caribou if i'm not mistaken i think that's right but yeah i'll travel from time to time yeah especially in the winter I'll, a lot of my family moved out oh, well i'm the only one actually left in alaska uh so during the holidays i feel obligated to go visit <laughs> all of my siblings or as many as i can and my parents down in tennessee and uh and so i, I definitely make the most of it i always try to figure out what kind of owl species i can find in every state new state that i go to so this last uh, winter break, which I just got back from uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we got to see a ton of long-eared owls out in Colorado. So that oh, was really? uh, that was nice. pretty incredible. Is there an explosion, or is that fairly common? Ask Brandon. I don't know. 
The the long ears are pretty common out here. I think people mistake them for the great horns. Yeah, just because they don't. But they usually don't long ears. Difference. Yeah, they're usually closer to the the base of the tree, whereas the great horns will be out in the middle of a branch and in between all the brambles. Yeah, those stinking long ears. It's hard to see them once again against get against the tree. You also were, were playing around. You posted something the other day. Maybe it was on a story or something. And you made an AI owl. And so <laughs> I queued up on that because I've been messing around on those AI programs. And one of the things I've been trying to make is is an image. So we always joke around about uh, ptarmigan being vicious, you know, predators on the tundra. And uh, try, ptarmigan is how we're all going to die. And so I've been going into the AI generators and typing in different versions of what I picture Tarmageddon will look like. So when you put in Tarmageddon, it doesn't pick, it just gives you like a picture of a Tarmageddon or whatever. So then I start typing in like Tarmageddon, cartoon Tarmageddon holding a sword under the Northern Lights or, you know, with a gun or something like that. And they just come back with their, it kind of sucks. But then the one you did was amazing. Like I got it. So I, now I have to make a note and go in. And uh, so what, what did you put into the AI to get that, uh, that. <laughs> oh man. Well, I'll have to give you the exact prompt I put in, but uh, it, I think it has more to do with the prompt or the, uh, the program that I was using, which was chat GPT or sorry, not chat GPT. It was uh mid journey AI. And uh, man, that thing is, is mind blowing. Uh, so I just, I wanted to kind of mess around just because I'm, I'm curious about technology uh, advancements and whatnot. So I, every now and then I'll, I'll just kind of see where things are at uh, with AI. And and I, I started messing around with some owl, owl compositions. And so I was like, all right, draw me up a, a long-eared owl uh, hunting in the moonlight, catching an insect. And I mean it came up with a better photo than I could possibly like try to come up with. Uh, even if I could control every var variable uh, out there, I don't think I would have been able to come up with something like this. <laughs> and uh, it's just absolutely mind blowing. Uh, aside from the fact that it, it just can't get the, the feet right. Uh, it, it can never get the, the hands or the feet or the talons of, of whatever you're trying to put in there. Uh, it, they're always deformed in some way. It's just so funny because every other detail, like literally every like coloration, every feather in the face is like completely spot on for, for a long eared owl. <laughs> and uh, so anyways, I saw Drew was uh, kind of starting to mess around with some of this. And, and so I tried it out mid journey AI and uh, it came up with some, some decent stuff, but it kind of had this weird issue where it was like always giving the tarm again, this, feathery or kind of kind of furry tail that almost looked like it was a mammal so it didn't didn't work quite right uh <laughs> but it looked like a ptarmigan squirrel with. hybrid yeah yeah which if yeah, that ever happened actually, we're screwed <laughs> well it would it would randomly give it like a snout like a little dog or something i'm like what are you doing man <laughs> <laughs> So maybe that is a little bit closer to Tarmageddon. Yeah. We start, we're be starting to get in the right occur. ballpark with that. Yeah. <laughs> I've not messed around with the AI, but I've seen some incredible stuff that's come out of it. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I don't know that I want to, except that you can just, you can just kind of go nuts with it and have some fun. It's definitely a, an artistic opportunity. What, uh, what kind of got you into that? Was it just some experimentation? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much <laughs> just me and my, my friends, me and my brothers will talk about it all the time and, and just see where things are at. Seeing if we're about to lose our jobs next week or, or where <laughs> things are headed. Yeah. Well, but you know, I think it is kind of a fun tool cause you can, you can kind of mess around with different compositions, pretty much anything you can imagine. You can just type it in there and uh, maybe I could kind of recreate some of the photos that I've taken in the past, but it, it's just kind of wild, all the possibilities there. And uh, I think it could actually be used as a tool for, for maybe like some camera trap uh, kind of composition setups and, and that type of thing. 
well, AI is just so in vogue. Like, you know, we, we, I mean, we probably all use Topaz or something and they're all advertising AI. I don't know if it's true AI or what it is, or I don't know. It's all, it's all above my pay grade, but it does seem like different aspects of these learning technologies are going to become more and more prominent in photo editing or frankly, photo replacement, <laughs> maybe. Uh, well, knows, I think, it's yeah, there's, I think there's lots of ways to think about it. You know, you've got AI with Photoshop and Topaz where it's just a learning tool to help sharpen an image a little bit. Uh, but then there's the AI where you're actually creating something. And I think that's, that's kind of the new, the new tools that are available. And it's the stuff I've seen is just incredible. I mean, it, it does look, it looks like you can put yourself in the perfect spot in the perfect circumstance every time. That's the, I guess the not danger of it, but that's, you know, the, why some people consider it cheating, et cetera. But I think, you know, there are no, there's no way to cheat to make a good photograph. There's only good photographs, right? Yeah, or good images. <laughs> so if you can create it, create it. Well, that's what you said, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can't call it a photograph. No. But yeah, no, I mean, it's just call it what it is, right? But to me, that just doesn't interest <laughs> me at all because there's no challenge in that. So to me, it's just personal. I don't know. I've been struggling mightily trying to get this Tarmageddon thing right. It's not easy. It ain't easy. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but so what uh, we've been kind of perusing your portfolio and kind of talking uh, uh, talking about the past year and things like that. But what does uh, what does this 2023 hold for you? Well, I'm really trying to get a handle on the Sawat Owl situation here in Homer. Uh, Cause last spring I went out around late February, early March, and I was able to, to find quite a few sawits uh, just down East end road here. Uh, I, at one point I, I drove down just with the windows rolled down, just listening. And I ended up hearing five different in individuals. Uh, and I've even heard a few just right outside my house. Uh, but the tricky thing is in Alaska, at least in my experience, uh, and kind of based on the habitat that that I live near, there aren't a whole lot of natural cavities for them to be living in. Uh, and, and so I really want to just kind of find a few and and just kind of try to find a nesting saw it. That would be a, a huge bucket list thing for me. You should go check out by my cabin up on Eagle Air. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's, hey, yeah, could, could, you, could you check on the place for me? <laughs> Maybe shovel. <laughs> There's got to be a ton of snow up there right now. Oh, I just had to shovel my watershed out and uh, and my driveway, and uh, that that was fun. You know, after being gone for a month, <laughs> that was a good time. <laughs> and there were a few big dumps but, uh, when you were gone. I know. Yeah. That's rough. And then it kind of melted down and turned into ice. And then you had to chip through that. And yeah, it's, it's a good workout for sure. <laughs> but uh, another thing I'm really looking forward to is this gnome trip that I'm going to be doing with, uh, with Jamin, Hunter Taylor, uh, Emily Reed and Ray Hennessy. And uh, we're just, you know, going there for fun and uh, hopefully going to focus uh, a bit on blue throats and all the fun migratory species, but obviously a huge part of that's just going to be getting some, some cool shots of the musk ox. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, my last trip there, I actually ended up seeing a Wolverine uh, out on Teller highway. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't as close or as crazy as some of Drew's experiences, but uh, it was still pretty cool to see one at that distance. It was maybe a hundred yet hundred yards out or 150 yards out. I was just telling somebody the other day how or we were on tour, we were talking about stuff and said, you know, for all the, you know, bears or moose or whatever, all these other animals, people love it. I still think Wolverines are kind of the ultimate. They sure would be, but I'm still over, over life on Wolverines. Thought <laughs> I, just, I saw one one time, but it wasn't. Where was that? Was it a cow? Please it tell me it was a cow. 
It was in Denali, and no, it was not a cow. I still, I don't know, it might have been a marmot. I don't know. <laughs> nice marmot. Wishful thinking on my part. Did you did you go looking for the blue throats on your last trip to Nome too, or what? What time of year was your I last did. trip to Nome? It was similar time of year. It was uh, it was early June, and uh, we did find a couple blue throats, but they didn't cooperate. And I found out after the fact that I was just a few miles short of kind of their preferred habitat on one of the highways. So that's all right. You know, we were a little more focused on the the muskox and and some of the other stuff uh the parasitic long-tailed jaegers and yeah it's just a, a fun place to explore that time of year parasitic I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make a bold statement baby muskox are top five cutest animals on the planet prove <laughs> me wrong i i wouldn't disagree with that oh, okay i should have phrased it different yeah <laughs> <laughs> You'll get no disagreement from me, but uh, the tough thing is that time of year, the, the bulls are, are just so protective and, and they'll all kind of do the roundup whenever you, whenever you try to get remotely close to them. So it can be tough to, to really photograph one uh, outside of a vehicle anyways. So that's, uh, that would be a huge goal for me to just, just, just uh, get a good little clear, clean shot of a baby musk ox. I worked with a friend of mine or a guy in Casper, he had, his brother lives in Nome and he had rented, he had rented several snowmobiles and ATVs to the BBC. They were up trying to film muskox and uh, they had a boar brown bear that pretty much, I, I think it was a hundred percent mortality. There was 32 calves and 32 mortalities. And it was in the, just the few days that, these guys were up there filming. So the rest of the time they end up filming brown bear um, predation sequences. So it uh, recruitment for a musk ox is, is got to be pretty tough. I mean, that's obviously why they're so protective. It's, you know, it's a little bit like the moose down here with now that they're getting used to the wolves being part of the ecosystem, their protective instincts or, or their behavior when threatened has changed significantly. They just had to deal with coyotes before and the wolves has been back for quite a while now, since 1995 and the moose population took a dive and now it's starting to come back because these cows are now becoming a lot more protective um, than they were, you know, just dealing with coyotes. So you look at an animal like a musk ox that's been around grizzly bears forever. And those, those specific protection behaviors i mean that's got to, that would be great to get on film it, it might not make for the best still image but to get it on film and and to see a whole sequence would be pretty incredible yeah i think i actually just saw a clip from bbc of a, of a bear taking out a whole family in yeah the snow. That's, and uh, the calves you know they don't see all that well so the they were running right at the bear right so it was pretty and, go ahead a lot of the uh, muskox at the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center, uh, a lot of them are orphans from bear predation. Uh, there'll be enough calves in the group to kind of separate and, and one that will one or two will escape um, and make it out and, and people will go find it and and fly it back to the Anchorage area. So that would be incredible to, to witness any kind of that uh, predation happening. Um, but did you guys hear about the there was actually a recent killing uh, from a musk ox. There was a guy trying to protect his his uh, his dog, his sled dog, I believe. And uh, yeah, things did not go well. He was actually a law enforcement officer, a ranger, wasn't he, Drew? Uh, I think he uh, he was a corrections officer, I believe. Was he? Yep. Um, I think so. <clears throat> but anyway, there it, it has. Uh, there's been a lot of calls for changing how they, they manage the muskox around gnome proper uh, because it is, you know, one of the, the defense mechanisms is just go hang out in somebody's yard and, you know, right. it doesn't necessarily yeah. mix well with, with their, cause you know, there's an active mushing community around gnome. You know, a lot of people have kennels and, and things like that, or just instance like this one that just happened um, while they don't happen frequently, you know, people do get 
chased around their house and things like that. Um, so there has been a, a call for, for maybe some different management strategies uh, in the gnome area, but we'll see, see what, see what comes of it. But mm-hmm. it's just, it's such an amazing place. It's, it's really one of the wild, I don't know. I love, no, <laughs> I love going to Nome. And well, that's where that was Julie's and my first date uh, was I flew up to Nome. We met online and flew up to Nome and she had a couple snow machines waiting and we went out looking for muskox in I think it was January, something like that. So muskox, I love, <laughs> we had little muskox on our wedding cakes. <laughs> it's kind of our family, family theme, I guess. Well, going back to your portfolio, though, sir, just you've you done a great job of capturing them in every light you can imagine, and you know I'm sure there there's always the get getting them in the fall color, or getting them in the middle of the winter with the you know wind blown look and those nasty nasty winds that no one can have, uh, but it it does bring out the characteristics that make them such a unique and unique animal i guess it's such a survivor because they they live in those incredibly harsh environments How, oh yeah absolutely have, you've gotten them in different light are you uh are you looking to go different seasons then or yes is absolutely that... yeah i've got a workshop planned uh, for this fall actually uh it's not going to be quite late enough to get kind of the harsh winter conditions but mm-hmm definitely a first step in kind of changing it up and uh yeah there won't be quite as much bird activity so it might be a little easier to just kind of focus on on getting them and and all the different kind of cool compositions and lighting but it's just it's a beautiful habitat beautiful landscape you know just these mountainous kind of tundra and uh yeah especially when you head out towards teller and you've got the ocean right there and Mm-hmm. it's just such a such a neat place so if so if you go there in the fall is that is that their rut too will you be able to right. maybe catch some rut activity yeah and so that's that was my goal was to yeah more focus more on the activity and all that i'm sure there there'll be calves but they're not going to be quite as cute and cuddly as <laughs> they were will be in the spring right <laughs> But hey, maybe that'll uh, make the rest of them kind of back off, and maybe I'll actually be able to get some decent shots of them. Relax a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that that one you have of the uh, the the adult muskox and the and the baby muskox backlit on the uh, like ridge line, or you know, going up the the hill with the sun. That's just magic. So, what's the story behind that one? Honestly, a lot of the, the days in Nome kind of blurred together. I was <laughs> there for four days and, uh, and we saw muskox every day. And that was one of the, the nicer days because uh, it, it wasn't quite as hot. So a lot, of the, a lot of the time it was no clouds whatsoever, you know, kind of just blue skies, just crummy lighting. And, uh, and we would get the worst heat distortion that I've ever had to deal with uh, at the point where I couldn't take a picture of anything past 30 yards uh it would be noticeably distorted at that distance and so it was really just you know uh dusk dawn uh hours between 1 and 5 a.m that was kind of our our main uh time to to get some nice shots so it was it was one of those nights where everything just kind of came together there was a big group that we were hanging out at and uh and and a couple of them started running up this hill and and i was like oh man that that could be a cool shot and uh sure enough there was a a mom with a calf and and they both followed suit and went the same path same trajectory and i just had to point the camera and uh yeah it was honestly kind of one of those things that just came up i didn't have to do very much planning (laughs) just see the opportunity and and snap the photo Oh, now you're getting me all fired up. So how do we sign up for your, uh, your workshop? Ooh, uh, that one is not online yet, but it's, it'll be up there in, in the next few weeks. Oh, such a tease. Ooh, you're just teasing yeah. us here with these <laughs> muskox talks. And, oh man. Yeah, Cause that is one I would love to do. Yeah, me too. I know it's on Ron's list too. 
Yeah. All right. There's three spots. Brandon, you in? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm gonna co-lead that with my buddy Jamin Taylor, uh, Jamin Hunter Taylor, if you know him. You got to get him out of Florida first, though, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now he's back. He's. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how happy he is to be back, but uh, <laughs> uh, he turned up some incredible stuff down there. Uh, little blue hair and with this awesome picturesque little bass in his mouth. Yeah, mm-hmm. some some killer stuff with barred owls too. But uh, yeah, we, we do a lot of stuff together. We've actually got another workshop that we've got uh, this spring. So we're going to do shorebirds mostly. Um, and out, out towards the Anchor Point area, that's where you get the mm-hmm. Mount Readout, uh, Mount Iliamna, all those. And uh, the sun sets basically right behind them. So just some awesome ap- opportunities for some backlit shorebirds and, and bald eagles and Arctic terns, Aleutian terns, all sorts of fun stuff out in that direction. So speaking of bald eagles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, speaking of bald eagles. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the other shot I thought Ron could have been talking about earlier. Yeah, I was going to get to that one. I I'd, I'd yeah. forgotten it. Well, Actually, was, when we so many great ones. When we were starting to talk about the AI, because I think if I'm not mistaken, you might have caught a little flack on this shot, and because people would think it was faked, because you've got those perfect yeah. perfect rays coming down behind that bird and you just have you know he's just in the or it is just in the perfect posture that's an incredible shot really how long is. i mean it obviously took you a lifetime to to catch that one but yeah it's funny you mentioned that there was definitely some guys on facebook that were like uh i i just googled this image and uh and you can see the the photo here you obviously didn't take it and uh and, and they were saying how photoshopped it was and <laughs> Uh, it's just whatever, but uh, no, it was just a, this awesome opportunity. I was once again out shooting shorebirds uh, over in the Anchor Point area, and I was I was there with Jamin actually, mm-hmm. and uh, and we we saw this pile of fish just right off the beach, and tons of tons of bald eagles hanging out, lots of juvies, lots of uh, full colored adults, and and so we just hopped out of my friend's truck and. And just squatted down, waited for them to fly back. Sure enough, they started coming back. And, uh, you know, for a long time, we were just kind of getting the, the classic in-flight shots of them swooping mm-hmm. in with the 200 to 500 and, and, and all the the classic shots that you want of the Eagles. Um, but I've, I've shot them so much uh, in my life growing up in Homer. So I don't usually stop for these guys, but the light was just starting to come in. Uh, it was about an hour before sunset, and it was it was starting to have a little bit of color in it, and the the clouds were were just breaking right above the mountains, and so that's where you get all this fun light leakage and light rays happening, and so I wanted to capture that. I I switched out uh, my 200 500 for the Tamron 70 200, uh, which I was. I was actually borrowing from Jamin. I was about to buy it off of him. <laughs> so that was my first time <laughs> using that lens. And, uh, you know, it, it's autofocus worked out. And and we had this beautiful adult bald eagle just swoop down. And uh, Jamin was lying down in the in the beach with me. And he had his 24 to 70. Uh, and I was more at the wide uh, at, end of my focal range. So we were we were both kind of getting similar shots. And, uh, and we both just nailed it. You know, it all worked out. Thankfully focused and mess up. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, I'm sure you could get that kind of shot again under the right circumstances, but, but how often do I actually stop right. for bald eagles? So it all just <laughs> kind of worked out. <laughs> so for me, that image is just, it's a perfect blend of, of composition, editing, uh, subject it all just comes together so nicely and all of your photos are so well edited and you do offer uh, one-on-one zoom editing if i remember correctly right yeah i've worked it in uh, a little bit on some of my workshops the editing side of things because I, I do think it is extremely important but yeah now, now i'm trying to push a little bit of the the mentoring side of things online so as people are listening, you can go to your Instagram or your actually your website, 
uh, is where I think I saw that that listed. So that would be a. But then people have they can edit, but they still have to go out and roll around in the beach at Anchor Point to get the to get the shot. If you want the shot. I, little, I, always wor- I always worry about what I'm rolling in at the beach at Anchor Point. You know, uh, fair enough. Uh, it was kind of a lower tide at that point. So I think everything that we were uh, lying down in was, was pretty fresh. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, are you going to be bouncing back and forth between Homer and Kodiak a lot? Absolutely, yeah. I already have been. So and no complaints here. I absolutely love Kodiak. Um, there's a little bit less to do there in the winter, but you know, they, they've got some emperor geese and some eiders and long tailed ducks hanging out there in the winter. So kingfishers, there's, there's plenty for me to do, but obviously that's not my only priority on my visits over. So I'll, <laughs> I'll kind of, uh, switch around between flying over there and taking the 10 to 14 hour ferry ride. <laughs> well, if you're going that way. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put an owl destination on your, your radar. And I'm just going to, I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to put this out there. I don't even care if, if people want to go there, good luck getting there. But if you are a short eared owl fan and you happen to find yourself at the furthest reach of the Kodiak archipelago, uh, Tagetic Island, it's, it's the, it's the furthest Island out in the, in the chain, in the Kodiak chain and uh, there are no bears it's all tundra and i have never seen so many owls just everywhere it was uh actually that might be one of the wilder places i've ever been they're just giant whale skulls all over the beach and it's crawling with black-tailed deer and short-eared owls and they just kind of fly around and look at you like where'd you come from (laughs) we haven't seen we don't get many visitors out here uh well, and you, so you say you're buying a boat, you're hanging out in Kodiak. It seems like the next, and you love owls. It seems like the next logical uh, step would be to get out to Tagetic. I think it's just past That's Sikinac. wild. Can you spell that for me? <laughs> T-U-G-I-D. There's, there's a K. It ends with K. Tagetic. There you go. Just, My confidence just, in the up. spelling of this <laughs> it's, uh, is running I'm fairly low on the. Like it's just past Sitkanak and like, yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. I know they do get some shorties and uh, some hawk owls over there in the winter, but I wonder if that's more of a breeding population out on that Island. I don't know. There's just lots of owls. That's the rest. I'll, I'll keep secret. I know all the details, but I'll let you figure out the rest. Uh, Brandon's got a lot for the show notes, but we're not going to put that in there. I dare people to try and get there. <laughs> well, unless people in Kodiak know how to get there. And they're just, it's weird. It's out there. Weather and, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was one of the wilder, when I was, when I was working for Fish and Game, we got, we went out because there was an old mining claim out there that uh, we had to go do some hazmat cleanup. And so we flew out and we got word that there was like a, uh, a shack on one end of the island with a couple four wheelers in it. And we were going to need that those to get to the other end of the island. And sure enough, we land and there's the shack. Therefore we get the four wheelers running, but one of them won't shift. So you had to like manually shift with that, you know, that knob that's down like back behind. So we had a crescent, an adjustable crescent wrench and one person's in the back, like shifting one person's driving kind of with one handed down the beach, like swallowing all these whale skulls and, uh, <laughs> shift and then they'd shift for you uh yeah no that was yeah you should definitely go out to Tagetic. but don't take don't take the four-wheeler that won't shift those make, <laughs> sure, you, make sure you grab the other one <laughs> <laughs> it would take you a long time to go around that island in first gear oh man yeah that'd be a blast to hang out at um yeah there's there's the gray whale migration that comes over there as well in the springtime so who knows maybe we'll have to hire a boat and Ooh. do some exploring what else did we oh we found you remember a few years ago when that uh that jack up rig broke loose uh the colic their shell was hauling this big oil rig and it broke loose and we found one of the lifeboats <laughs> from, from the colic washed up on the beach of this island it was huge 
I wanted to claim salvage rights and drive it back, but I couldn't get it back in the ocean. Things you find on the beach in Tagolic Island. Did I say it right? <laughs> Not even close. You, you said it like I spelled it. <laughs> so that's what I told you. That's what I was going with. <laughs> Oh man! Well, it's just bringing Surges, back all sorts of memories. Yeah, Sergis, we're uh, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and I know we talked about your website. If you'd go ahead and tell everybody where to find you on Instagram as well, sure. And then yeah, you've got so, a YouTube channel as well, so go ahead and throw that out also. Oh, how'd you dig that up? Oh, uh, dude, <laughs> I'm a I'm a researching machine. When I when I yeah. have to scramble. Well, I just subscribed to your channel, so I was wondering if maybe that was it. Uh, no, but I'm just starting to get into YouTube, and it there's just some shorts on there for now. But really starting to uh, hopefully get some some wildlife vlogs out there. But uh, honestly, I don't even know what the handle is on there. It's probably just Sergis Hannon. Um, but my Instagram is uh, Sergis Hannon underscore photography. That's S E R G I U S. H A N N A N. And, uh, and my website is just surgishannon.com. Pretty simple enough. I'm looking up, I'm looking up YouTube because I know I'm still on it. I haven't come across another Surgis Hannon, but I could be wrong. <laughs> you, nope, you are correct. <laughs> it's just your name. <laughs> so, with that, Lynx, you did do some video, right? I think, didn't I see a little video clip of the Lynx like coming down the tundra or something? So there is, there is. Yeah, I got some. Yeah, yeah, got some some full frame footage of of the lynx coming down, uh, and then some cell phone footage of of the sheep running back and forth and freaking out. Yeah, check out my Instagram for some of the behind the scenes for some of the shots we've been talking about today. Yeah, and and we'll have a few of them in the show notes as well. We could go on, I think, for <laughs> quite a while with Drew telling stories about rolling and different stuff on the beach. If nothing else. <laughs> oh no, yeah, don't even yeah, get no, started a, with that. A, AI Tarmageddon. <laughs> yes. I'm looking forward to that. We might we might have to make a full podcast out of that. But he's probably gonna have to get a hold of you to figure out exactly what he needs to be doing that he's whatever he's doing wrong so we can get this thing done. No, I wrote it down mid journey A plus. <laughs> I already ran out of my free trial, so it's all on you. Oh, oh, pressure's on. I think you get right, 25 on. entries. 25, You've got okay. 25 opportunities to create mass chaos and blood. If you can't get it in 25, you're doing something wrong. Thank you all for listening to another episode of Wild and Exposed. Surges, thank you for joining us. And if I said your name wrong, I have a friend named Sergio, and I think I might have slipped that in early on in the podcast, and I apologize for that. It happens on occasion. Okay, that's good. Maybe I didn't. But uh, again, thanks for joining us. And thank you all for listening to Wild and Exposed Podcast. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed Podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday Nothing's gonna get in our way We will be the biggest band in time